Adam White here with another episode of Office Hours. Today, I have the pleasure to be joined by Peter Hutton, the director of global sports over at Facebook. And besides people chasing you for your Facebook money, Peter, what it's been like for the last, you know, year and a half or so in the role as you've transitioned away from uh, Eurosport? Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, it's a completely new life for me, let alone the moving to California and moving to the States for the first time. Just working in an industry, a, uh, a tech company like Facebook is so different from anything that I've done before. You know, I've done Fox and Disney and Discovery and all these different sorts of media companies. But Facebook is different, you know, and it's a really interesting place to be. How's it been living in the US for the first time? Uh, you know, a few things need translation, but, um, <laughs> but in general, it's been great, you know, and um, it's been a real sort of pleasure for me to go watch lots of American sport as well. Um, you know, I'm still an obsessive sports fan, so getting to see the games, going to meet a lot of the people that are involved around the games is a, is a real sort of a nice opener for me and um, enjoying it. Has the US lived up to the hype? Um, I, honestly, I think it's been great. And, <laughs> and it's one of those things as a sort of cynical English person, particularly having been a journalist for so many years, yeah. you're not supposed to be really enthusiastic. But I love the energy here, you know, and it's really been a really positive experience, not just for me, but for family as well. You know, two boys who are genuinely excited about being here. And, and that's great. Yeah, awesome. We'll love to hear that. And so obviously you're into this role in Facebook, right? You have the opportunity now ahead of us with 2022 or 2020 on the horizon. For you, what does 2020 look forward look like and going forward for Facebook, especially on the sports side of things? I think it's a really exciting time because we're very clear as to sort of what our role is. You know, we're a free-to-air funnel that opens up a range of different experiences. And I think when you look at the issues that face the sports industry, one of the things that's really helpful is that you look at Facebook and say, look, we can help you with that. We can help you with the issues that you're facing, whether those issues be piracy or a lack of willingness to pay for product or smaller attention spans potentially or younger audience is. And Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger and Oculus have really got part of the solution to those problems. So what I like about the job more than anything else is that idea that we're almost there to consult. You know, we go in, we talk to sports brands, people know they need to work with us. They know where people are consuming the content. So it's more a question of saying, OK, how do our tools fit your problems? How can we solve your needs? Um, and generally working with people together. Um, and, and that's a, a great place to be. And it's a lot less confrontational and adversarial than some of my previous roles. And I'm sure there's probably some misconceptions about your guys' role in the sports industry. What has it been like, you know, people coming to you and thinking that there's a blank check for, for media rights or things like that? It's probably been some interesting conversations. Uh, it's mainly from journalists, to be fair. But, um, yeah, you know, I think one of the problems of having come from what I did before and, and, you know, we did a lot of big rights deals at Eurosport and at Fox and other places is that people presume you're going to come and do the same thing. Um, but, frankly, that's not really what interests me. I think what is interesting is saying... OK, as an organization, how can we work with the sports industry? How can we actually drive real revenue? How can we drive fandom and engagement, um, get younger people involved with sports organizations? And that's the bit that's, that's really cool about the job. Um, and I think it's important to permanently sort of set that out. And, and it's a bit boring maybe sometimes for some of the people that interview me because I return back to the same subjects a lot. But I think generally that's our role, you know, and, and having content that's free to air I think is so important and easy for people to access and just open up that route to the next fan. And I think really important to keep that front and center of everything you think about. And one of those free to air experiments that you guys did with, with Major League Baseball the last couple of years, what, what is that like in that relationship and kind of the success and how do you take what you did with Major League Baseball and potentially apply it to other leagues? I think that was one of the things that we do a lot is we look at case studies. We say, okay, what we've learned from this is certain learnings and we'll share that with other people in the industry. With Major League Baseball, one of the great things was that we could say, look, your average age of a viewer on Facebook is 20 years younger than the viewership on uh, traditional linear media. And that in itself is a, is a great message. But I think it's also what you do with the content. You know, I think it's really important that we try and give fans a positive experience if content is on Facebook. Um, and as a result, you know, things that I, I really get out of the baseball uh, part of it was you look at all the chat down the side of the screen and fundamentally, that is a positive if you want to be engaged and you want to be part of a community. But it could be a negative because you're hit with a wall of noise. It's not necessarily a positive thing. 
So as a result, we worked with MLB. We brought in things like you pin the important comments, you sort of direct the conversation in a more interesting way rather than just have like a load of people going hi and woo and, and whatever. <laughs> and if you can turn it into a positive experience that makes it a genuinely better second screen experience around the main screen, then I think you're doing something useful. And from a second screen experience, do you think that one of the biggest advantages that you see some of these platforms streaming Twitch, other OTT opportunities have is, is this chatter, is this engagement functionality that you can't theoretically get? Like, I can't talk to my friend watching a game on TV. I think the reality is that people are talking, right? And it's a natural behavior and that you want to be sharing your emotional experiences around a game. I mean, um, I'm, I'm now as, a, as an English football fan up between seven and nine on the, on the West Coast. Thanks a lot for that. Um, <laughs> on, a, on a Saturday and Sunday morning. And the most frustrating thing is if you're not talking to anybody while you're watching yeah. a game and, yeah. and the cat gets a lot of abuse. So it's nice <laughs> to be able to chat with someone about what you're going through. Yeah. Um, so I think it's natural behavior. And to be able to build that into your sports viewing experience and to talk to like-minded individuals and realize you're not the only obsessive who's watching this game, I think is a really positive thing. So leagues and broadcasters should see Facebook as a, as a partner and not, a, not something that's predatory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... You know, we work really closely with all the big players around the world, you know, and, and the other bit of the job that is, is really cool is the fact that, you know, we're working with Flamengo in Brazil and we're working with um, sports broadcasters in Asia and, and genuinely you're trying to um, allow them to make their next steps forward to help their businesses grow. Um, and we're definitely a partner. We're not a, a confrontational figure for, for the likes of ESPN or DAZN. They are people that use us to try and build their audiences. Um, and, and nice to sort of be dealing with old friends in that way. And so do you think there's a market? I know obviously you guys have you know, the, the relationship with the WSL, MLB we talked about. Is there a market long term for Facebook and live rights in, in the sports industry? And, and is, it, is it more so like kind of just, you know, you're picking and choosing at the right time and something that may fit? I think we're learning all the time. And again, you talked about, you know, what's different about working at a place like Facebook. And I think fundamentally, it's the idea that you're permanently working with engineers who are improving the product, improving the platforms. So you look at the data of what we're doing around the live content, and you try and make it a better experience. You know, you mentioned the surfing and things like that. And Ironman are really logical fits, right? Because surfing, you know, number one problem is you don't know when it's starting. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. weather dependent. So the idea that you can get a notification that says it's starting now, come watch it, come share that experience with your friends, that's a really logical white space that we're able to fill that a traditional broadcaster can't fill. You know, you look at something like Ironman and live events that go on over like 10, 12 hours. You know, that's a great fit. You know, linear broadcast can't cope with that sort of content. And also it's a worldwide appeal of content. You know, people are watching the surfing and Ironman like all over the world. And it doesn't necessarily have the sort of um, support in any individual market to great big TV deals, but everyone can watch it through us. So I think... It's important to look at the white space and say, where do we add value into the sports industry? And, and those are two good examples. In the U.S., obviously, you came to the U.S., you're living in the U.S., you're dealing with probably more U.S. leagues and properties that you were when you were at your former roles. What's it like going into a, a different media market and kind of like the differences between an international market and, and you know, the U.K. and now a you know, domestic market here in the U.S.? What's, what's that been like for you? Uh, look, basically, for the, like, the last 30-odd years, I've sort of traveled around the world and, and now I'm on to 81 countries as of wow. last week. Um, and worked in probably most of them. When, when I say 81 countries, my family basically say, you mean you've seen the airport and the football <laughs> ground? Um, and that might be largely true. Um, and I think, you know, the, the good thing as you travel is that it, it's the same skill sets. And, and the beauty of sport is that it's a shared language and a conversation you can have around the world. You know, that if you're a sports obsessive and you're talking to another sports obsessive, you instinctively get each other pretty quickly. Um, and it's as a result, language in the world. It is, you know, and, and although the problems are slightly nuanced in different markets and, and, you know, the broadcast system here with the sort of growth of cable was way ahead of most of the rest of the world, a lot of the issues are still the same issues. Um, and that cord-cutting phenomena that was seen as an American phenomena is now a worldwide phenomena. So, you know, you learn from other markets and, and listen and, and hopefully you can give good advice as well. Obviously, sports betting is much bigger abroad, too. Is that something, when you talk about engagement in these platforms, is that something that you think Facebook can play a role in or have people come to you and said, hey, 
let's explore some type of sports betting opportunity because obviously it's beginning to blow up here domestically. Sure. I mean, the, the reality is that Facebook's got a big sports betting operation, but they're people who are consulting the sports betting companies in places like the UK and Ireland, where it's really an established part of the culture. You know, you go to a game in the UK, there's always a booth sort of not more than five minutes from your seat where you can go and place a bet on a game. And it helps you become more engaged with that content. And I think, you know, culturally, the things are a different place in different countries. Um, so you watch to see how it will develop. It's certainly a massive opportunity for the sports industry here. It's also important to do it within the right social framework and guidelines. You know, the, everyone here talks about how established it is in the UK and how part of um, social culture it is. But in the last year, the betting regulations in the UK have completely changed so that broadcasters can actually do a lot less gambling advertising on air. So, again, it's changing all over the country, the, all over the world. The policies are different all over the world. And you've just got to sort of read the, the local practices and see what works here. You talked about opportunities and mentioned sports betting being one of them. For you, someone who's been in the media industry for now 30 years, uh, what does it look like? Obviously, there's a, everyone talking about oh, the death of this and the death of that, and we're not going to do this and we're not going to be able to do that. Where do you see some white space and some opportunities there where it may not be a doomsday type call? I think, first of all, that there's very little stuff that's really dying. You know, if you look at the broadcast figures um, around the world, there are really positive stories out there. And they're not necessarily positive stories with the sort of age group that you necessarily want. But viewing figures are going up. You look at the NFL here, you look at the Premier League in the UK, you look at cricket in India – all on traditional broadcast channels and all with the numbers going up sizably in the last year or so. So it's clearly not a simple story. I think um, there are obviously opportunities around um, how you engage with your audience. And, and clearly it's true that audiences are more and more on social media and want to consume content on social media. So I think then the challenge is how do you make it relevant? How do you make um, a fan on Instagram as excited about being a supporter of your club as you did with an old linear TV fan. And, and that's the opportunity is, is find that space, create good content, listen to good advice, and then act on that content. Use the triggers that that content creates to then build a wider business for yourself, build a deeper engagement with the fan. And on that basis, then sports franchises are in good places. What's an example of someone who's doing that in a good, in a good way, building wide, uh, especially potentially working with you guys? Oh, look, I'll go for a non-American example because yeah. it's easier for me. But, <laughs> but you go for someone like Liverpool and the Fenway organization and what they've done with Liverpool, and they've clearly seen um, the opportunity in investing in social media. You know, And Peter Moores, who's the CEO there, came out of Silicon Valley, went back to, the, to Liverpool as a fan who'd seen the way the world is moving. And as a result, he gave a speech um, what, about a year ago saying, my opposition is not Manchester United, it's Fortnite. And he said, you know, we need to capture those young hearts and minds, capture that attention, get people into being a Liverpool fan at an early age and then sustain them, make sure that they stay with us. And it's people like that, that sort of vision at the heart of what they do that I think works well. You know, and, and people here, you know, you look at Miami Dolphins and what they do on the platform and how they use it to then stimulate ticket sales, retarget audiences. You know, the US, again, often leads the world in these things. Um, so good to be here and, and to see the opportunities around us. And, and for you, I guess, going forward, what are the opportunities for Facebook proper? And then also just, you know, now that you have all of these different areas underneath you, Instagram, like what is the interplay when it comes to sports on Facebook proper and then also the other uh, areas in which the business kind of trickles down? Uh, honestly, I'd say Facebook proper is everything, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so it's WhatsApp, it's Messenger, it's all the rest. And I think the, the messaging services are really interesting because of that idea of conversational commerce and, and building a sort of structure. You know, every football fan in the world appears to be part of a WhatsApp group around their team, around their group of friends. It's a natural way of, of conversing with another sort of set of fellow fans, right? Um, I think if you look at the, the Facebook business, you know, Facebook is clearly still a huge player because of the reach, the amount of people it touches with your messages on a daily basis, and the way that you can build up those groups, those communities around your content. I think Instagram is like an incredible success story, but I'd pick out particularly for athletes. You know, athletes are the new publishers, and people want to see what an athlete is saying, and that authentic voice that an athlete can have on social media is a really big step forward for the sports industry. You know, for me as a fan to listen to what a player said directly after the game and to give his authentic view of what happened, I think is a great opportunity. So, you know, really nice to see that develop as a trend. And I think you'll see athletes more and more as publishers. 
do you think you guys are going to do more with athletes in terms of potential tools or a way that you guys are working with them or what kind of that interplay looks like? Because obviously you guys are working with publishers and media companies. So what does that, that relationship then become with athletes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've got teams of people who work specifically with athletes to talk about best practices on the platform, how they can grow their fan base, how they can potentially commercialize that fan base. And I think that's definitely something that we'll look at more and more. Um, and that's a, a worldwide phenomenon. You know, it's cricketers in India, it's Lewis Hamilton in the UK, it's NFL stars here. And um, I think that's a really interesting area. That idea that you can talk directly to your favorite athlete, I think, is a, is a wonderful thing. You talked about conversational commerce. I know Instagram rolled out shopping and is rolling it out more and more. How does this commerce play in the sports industry and how is it you guys have kind of approached, I would say, like you mentioned, consulting with these people in terms of, okay, here's the best opportunity to take advantage of selling a jersey on Instagram or what it looks like potentially driving revenue. Because at the end of the day, people, especially in executive levels, are going to be like, okay, digital is great, but what's it doing for the bottom line? Sure. I think the idea that you're converting people is quite important in that how do you find out if someone's a fan? Well, you can find out if someone watched one minute of video from your latest highlights. That clearly tells you they're a fan, right? And they like your sport. There's something there. So they're the natural people to be targeting if you're trying to sell tickets, if you're trying to sell merchandise. And just if you're trying to build a fan base, you know, send them information, bring them into the fold. And as a result, you've got a commercial potential there. The other one that's huge for us is branded content and the idea that, you know, clearly advertisers love the platforms because they can target certain demographics. If you can target it with the sports IP that brings you that emotional engagement, that's a really good fit for us. So I think you'll see more and more clubs and leagues using branded content to talk to their fans and also make their sponsors happy. You know, it's a perfect combination. The worst thing as a sponsor is you buy like a board at a, a stadium and then what do you do with that? You know, branded content is a great way of building on that relationship with a club, with a league, and then using it to talk directly to your customers. What are some of the most interesting conversations you're having with some of these leagues and teams that you can share? Oh, I think, you know, it's, it's honestly, it's different wherever you go in the world. And, um, you know, that, that's fascinating. I think, you know, we had the International Cricket Council in to choose an obscure one um, last week who were talking about how they grow the women's game. And they've seen all the women's sports that have grown on Facebook and the idea that you can try and build a wider fan base. You can bring in new communities, bring more diversity into the system. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think you look at things like VR and AR. You know, Facebook is investing really heavily in those areas. And I think, though it's still a work in progress, I think we'll see huge developments in that space in the next year as the headsets become lighter, as the prices go down, as the content that's on them is more interactive and more interesting experience. So, you know, lots of different things to talk about. But um, I think the VR and AR thing for me is is massive, and, you know, I'd, I'd love to see where that's going to go. How does that play into the sports strategy for you guys on the, on the VR, AR standpoint, or how are you guys already kind of leveraging it? Oh, I think, you know, you look at basic stuff like the filters that are growing up. We did one with the Olympics with, like, a year to go to Tokyo which was huge and um, it had like the Olympic rings as glasses and that sort of went viral and it's a really nice way of the Olympics getting their message out touching a lot of people but then I think you look at the potential developments into sports production and how VR and AR can improve live match production and we're clearly not there yet but there's so many interesting developments in that area where you can immerse yourself in a game uh, you look at some of the volumetric stuff where, you know, you can basically stand behind the, the kicker as he takes a kick in the NFL and you visualize exactly what he's going through. And stuff like that, I think, is really interesting because it makes you closer to the sport, closer to the um, issues that a player is going through, closer to their mental process. And as a result, that should make you a, a deeper fan. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. And I think you mentioned this stuff about, <clears throat> and we talked about live sports, obviously, but another big thing about Facebook on the sports side is a lot of the shoulder programming you guys have, which would be traditionally what you would find on linear, right? You have shows, you have TV, or not TV, you have episodes, you have episodic series, right? Mm. How's the growth been like there? And where do you see some of these areas like a Bleacher Report and the, how, and the shows that they have with you guys and these other areas where theoretically it doesn't, it's not live sports, but it's still sports? Yeah, I think the reality is that people want to consume information all day, every day, right? And one of the joys of, of what's happened over the last sort of, you know, 40 years since I started doing this business um, has been the way that you can get more and more obsessive, more and more detail, more and more closer to your players. Um, and content like this allows you to do that. And, you know, fans aren't fans just for the duration of the game. They're, they're 365 days a year and 24 hours a day. And important to have that range and depth of content that they can dive into when they want more about your club, about your players. You've been, you mentioned, around for a while in this industry. You've seen it all. 
What are some of the challenges you feel or some of the headwinds that may be coming over the course of the next two to five years that either you've been watching out for or people have been telling you, hey, this is what I'm watching out for? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly the change of the pay TV industry is massive. Um, and, and that's not news here, you know, because I think everyone's been aware of it in the US a lot earlier than the rest of the world. But everyone has, has built a sports industry on the inexorable growth of pay TV revenues. Um, and that's changing. And, and that isn't so inexorable. Um, again, I, I don't see it as something that's going to drop off a cliff. I think there's still a really strong route there for a sports broadcaster. And the sports broadcasters are often the best OTT broadcasters as well. But it's definitely changing. And I think as a result, you can't necessarily rely on the same revenue lines growing at the same pace. So therefore, you need to broad base your revenue. I think the second part of it is looking, looking for that younger audience and understanding that they're consuming in a different way and that you need to be in the places where they're consuming. And I think that's a worldwide trend and important that therefore you create content that is relevant to people in a way that, that, that fits their consumption habits. And, and therefore highlights access to athletes, small form content, GIFs, memes, things like that are an important part of your content play in a way that they clearly weren't before. So do you think that when everyone thought that there was going to be a tech company gold rush in terms of all this money coming from a lot of these people, it was a little premature? Um, yeah. I mean, I think it depends how you define a tech company. Again, yeah. you know, you look at some of the big rights deals that have happened in the last sort of couple of months in, in Europe. And you've seen Amazon come into Champions League in, in uh, Germany. You see DAZN's continued spend around the world. You know, if you define those as tech company spends, then it is changing, you know, and the competition is coming from that area. But the reality is that still the majority of major rights are held by linear broadcasters and the traditional linear broadcasters, and the majority of new deals are still going in their direction. So the, the world is changing. There is some new money coming in. Um, and that's good for the sports industry because if there wasn't that competition or the threat of competition, then prices can go down and that changes the whole ecosystem. What are some trends that you're like buying and selling? So what is it something that you're like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen and something like, no, 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 this isn't probably going to happen? Oh, I think, um, good question. I think um, certainly the, the athlete publishing area is something that, you know, we, we have to, everybody has to lean into, you know, that the athletes are your best ambassadors. If you've got great content, let's get them posting it. If you've got great content that's stored, let them get access to it so they can post their own highlights of their best plays. You know, that's an authentic voice. It's a great way of getting good content out to more and more people. So that, that's the one I'd pick out. Which one are you saying? That's probably not going to happen. What are you selling? What are the, the hot takes that you're selling? Oh, what's not going to happen? I, again, you know, to your point, it's not necessarily going to be about the fangs creating some big explosion of the sports rights business. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is changing. The world is changing. Consumption habits changing. The graphs in terms of pay TV subscribers can look pretty frightening. And as a result, I think everyone needs to be a little bit defensive for the future and look at where their new revenue lines are going to come from and where their new engagement is going to come from. And I think that that's the number one message. Where do you see some of these new revenue lines coming from besides working with Facebook? Oh, it's all about working with Facebook. Yeah, of course. No, you, I think... Um, you know, you, you look at that branded content space and, and that's such a great fit for sport, you know, in that the sponsorship revenues are going up for sports franchises all over the world and the sponsors are going to want value back. And value back means you've got to be able to speak directly to the consumers that they're targeting. So I'd say branded content is really going to rise over the next couple of years. What about ticket sales? And I want to kind of get your feedback on this as just a, as a media person. Obviously, there's a whole big push around getting people to attend live events, but then it feels like people are, are priced out of it. And then, you know, almost like what you guys are delivering on a free model and everything like that. It, how is that interplay like in terms of just going forward and making sure that this media business is still good while also being able to attract people to really what is the live content happening? Yeah, I think it's about, in you know, investing in the experience and, and making that experience better you know and I was with the 49ers last week and they were talking a lot about how they're um, investing in just food and drink stuff around the stadium and how they're making it easy for people to access content um, and, and get more premium experiences feel like they're experiencing something special um, because I think if you look at the big games there's certainly no shortage of, of demand to go there but it's also really important to have full stadiums to create that atmosphere because without the atmosphere, it's also not a good media product. So I think, you know, you have to follow the logic through and say, OK, if I'm going to get X from media rights, I'm also going to invest a certain percentage of that to make it a better experience in the stadium, to make my product feel more dramatic and to feel like, you know, people care and they're right in the faces of the players. Yeah, and I think one thing that's a little bit more unique, at least on the U.S. side in terms of the, the 
events that we have. And we, and we have a lot more commercial breaks than traditional, like, in, let's just say international soccer, right? You have one in the middle, and then at the end, and you're not having 45 minutes of unfettered types of entertainment. Do you see more, obviously, we're starting to see more picture-in-picture picture ads and things like that. Do you see more of that starting to happen where adding more value to the consumer and not maybe playing as many ads or things like that? Because at the end of the day, the Premier League has record rights deals, and theoretically, they don't to show as many ads as into like one NFL game, right? Uh, I mean, the Premier League, if you look at it in the UK, is even more ad-free than watching it here. You know, you don't get the logos on the top of the screen, that NBC show. Um, so again, it's partly cultural. It's partly what people are used to. Um, I think the picture-in-picture stuff is really useful and important because I think it keeps an audience, you know, whether that be scrolling information at the bottom of the screen that ESPN started, what, 10, 15 years years ago, ago. or or whether it be, you know, the pictures of the players sort of on the pitch while the NFL games are on, ads are still playing, but it keeps your attention there and therefore it adds value back to 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 an advertiser. Um, You know, you certainly would say, look, advertising has to change with those times. It's not a question of, expecting people to sit there with their remote and not twitch it. Um, I, I work a lot and, and have worked in the past a lot with organizations like Supernor who put in virtual billboards that is targeted to individual locations. I think that's a really interesting route to go down, which you could see more and more of. Rather than going off necessarily to a linear ad, maybe you target your advertising that appears to be coming from the stadium to different demographics, different localities, and try and sort of tailor your market in that way. Well, then it becomes your, your ad inventory. If you're in 10 different markets, you're selling the same inventory 10 times. So now you have an opportunity to, to increase your revenue. Uh, I mean, you look at like some of the big soccer brands like Manchester United with over sort of 25 local banking sponsors in different markets of the world. You know, and clearly if you've got one banking ad going out to the wrong market, it's a waste of effort. Yeah. So, you know, that's a logical route to go down, just tailoring your advertising to an audience, which of course is where Facebook came in to start with. Yeah, of course. And why do you think for some on the international side, obviously, it, it, you know, you can go back and forth about who's more innovative and who's not. From, but like just to talk about soccer for a little bit and obviously kind of your background, why do you think international soccer is, is ahead on a number of different occasions from a media standpoint, especially when it comes into investing in content, right? You go internationally and these content teams are 30, 40 people. You come to the U.S. and you have some teams who have five people on their content team. Um, I'm not quite so bullish about it, I have to say. I think you go to yeah. the big six in the U.K. or the big two in Spain, yes, absolutely, there's big content teams. You know, but on average, I'd say the average NFL team or MLB team even is is a, ahead of the average Premier League soccer team. You know, this is not necessarily about the Premier League does things better or, or one organization does it better than the other. I think the rich, um, forward-looking organizations are always going to be well-staffed and, and therefore they create content that is perhaps more relevant to the audience because of that staffing. But it's not all about that. It's also about creativity and having the right guy. You know, you've got... Football teams, and you know, we're looking at something in um, South Africa recently where they created some great viral content around their team. And it's just one guy, but it's one guy with skills and ability and an instinct for good content, and therefore it makes it work. Speaking of good content, what is the, some of the content that you guys see perform well on, on Facebook or that you've kind of consulted people to kind of look more towards? Uh, look, I mean, the authentic personal content for an athlete is clearly something that really works. You know, when someone opens up their heart, gives you like what they really feel about a moment, um, and they do so in a sort of authentic way, then that's that's always gold dust, right? And and you'd never sort of go beyond that. Um, but just clips and the highlights works great. Um, and, and for me, live sport is always going to be special, you know, because live sport is the best drama there is going, uh, and people will always want that dramatic story. And if you care about the background to the story, you covered the story in an engaging way, then people will always want to dive in more. So, you know, there's different things for different people, and, and it's just nice to see good content creators out there. And often content creators now that are not from large organizations and big corporate worlds, but just guys with talent or women with talent that are making good things themselves, they're doing it for their own sort of love of what they're making. And that's often the best content that's out there. Yeah, you can't binge watch live sports, at least last time I checked. Oh, uh, you know, Saturdays and Sundays in, in the US, you can binge <laughs> yeah, watch quite yeah, a lot yeah, of NFL. Yeah, of course, but, of course, of course. But yeah, you know, I think um, that, that live moment is still special. Yeah, of course. And I guess going forward, you know, we talked about 2020 of Facebook. What is it? What do you think, like, as you look into 2020, 2021, 2022, when a lot of these rights deals in the US are starting to come up and beyond? What does that look like for Facebook and how are you guys kind of preparing for that or even helping prepare the partners who are going through these discussions with linear broadcasters for this type of opportunity? 
Oh, look, I think Facebook changes really fast. And, you know, we, one of the great things about being there is it's permanently reinventing itself and improving the product and improving the experience. So it's really difficult to look forward and say this is definitely what we'll be doing in two yeah. years' time. But I think fundamentally our role is as a free-to-air funnel that's um, taking people towards premium experiences. Um, it's about building communities and engagement that keeps fans loyal and keeps them following a, a set route. And um, I think that's still going to be our, our key role. I'd love to see where VR and AR is going to be in a couple of years' time. Um, I think it's going to be a more and more important part of sports production. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the familiar names that have the rights now will have the rights in a few years' time. But maybe the companies will be in different shapes and they'll have bigger OTT presences or a bigger direct-to-consumer business in one way or the other. What are your thoughts on the OTT and direct-to-consumer business and kind of that explosion and whether or not, you know, again, people are talking about a potential bubble there, but whether or not, like, is, is there going to be too many OTT platforms? Is there going to be too many things to potentially subscribe to? I think it's about what you care about, right? And, you know, so I, I subscribe to an OTT platform for my English football club, Derby County, and that is definitely not going to be on the list of most people's <laughs> OTT platforms. But for me, it's really important. And it's an opportunity to watch games that otherwise I wouldn't see. And that's a great gap in the market because it wasn't on TV. I couldn't get it without paying. I'm happy to pay for it. And it's a really nice part of my, my life now, um, at least in my eyes, maybe not the family. <laughs> but um, and, and therefore, OTT is great at opening up those different content windows and monetizing content that doesn't monetize being part of a bundle. Um, Having said that, you know, again, linear TV and the traditional models is still the majority of income by far. And I think there's always going to be a question about the funding of sport by OTT and when that reaches the same sort of numbers in a logical business sense as the traditional media has done. So it's, it's a fascinating area to see how it will develop. I think the good thing for Facebook and Instagram and what we do is that OTT platforms use us to find their next audience that putting content out on Facebook tells you if someone's a potential subscriber. So we can help that journey. Um, but I think, you know, the role of OTT, how it will be bundled, how many make sense to, as viable propositions is still open for a lot of debate. Um, but it goes all the way from big premium, you know, million dollar bundles that, that people want to talk about and that individual sport that maybe otherwise won't be found. Um, so there's always a role for the smaller ones as well. So you think it maybe is, I wouldn't say it's been overhyped, but I feel like a lot of it is kind of like, it's just a hot new thing. And then everyone's like, oh, this is going to be what's going to be next, where theoretically it could probably succeed on a smaller scale level as part of a, a, what we've talked about, a more like diversified revenue mix. Yeah, I think it's part of a, a diverse business, right? And and the business is TV, it's OTT, it's free to air, it's the traditional broadcasters, it's, it's new broadcasters. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to find content. And that's why it's almost like the EPG is the issue. You know, how do you find the content out there? How do you promote the way to go and reach that content? And that becomes the next challenge. I think there's no question that more and more ways of consuming media will be out there. I think the real challenge is making sure that your fans know that it's there and can get to it easily. What are some of the solutions you feel like for something like that about finding content or surfacing content? I look, I think the thing that's really key is building up, you know, big communities of people that will share that information. Um, and if a game is on, that your fan base should know where that game is. Um, and I think that's where social media really helps. Um, and I think, you know, that, that funnel, that idea that you can consume a little bit of content and that can take you in a direction that you want to go in, I think that's a really important principle that is at the heart of the next sort of uh, 10 years of sports media. And you talk about groups, right? And I know groups for a sports standpoint is a pretty big push for you guys. What is the directive for you when it comes to working with these teams and leagues around groups and how you've seen success and where you can kind of find ways to make sure that you're almost super serving what would probably be your super fans who've kind of self-identified, hey, I want to be in this group? Yeah, I mean, it clearly is a good idea for any sports organization to find their super fans, right? And those super fans are going to be at the heart of what you do. And therefore, groups makes a lot of sense for, first of all, for an organization to sort of establish that and support that and give them content and, and look after that group of people. But it also makes sense for the fan because you want that sense of community. You want that sense of a shared loyalty, of shared suffering as well as shared joy. And I think, therefore, it's a really positive experience. And I guess, too, from a broader media perspective and just everything that's going on, what are you most excited about going forward in terms of just as your role evolves, as the industry evolves, 
what what like I wouldn't say gets you up in the morning, but what is the thing that really makes you like, oh wow, this is this is really cool. I really enjoy this. I think it's that sense of permanent change, you know, and the idea that um, you, you're permanently developing a business that is going in different directions, that's taking new um, experiences, but at the same time is still based on that same love of sport, the love of the game, the idea of bringing your kids with you to a match, of building that family community, of building the wider community around a team. Those are the bits that, you know, I still think are, are really important. And that might sound old fashioned, but I just think the way that you do it will be reinvented. Um, but those fundamental emotional moments that make you a sports fan are still going to be there. Yeah, I mean, it's just like I went to a hockey game and I'm still a hockey fan because my dad took me, right? It's just it's going to be something that at the end of the day, Netflix and all these things are great, but I don't remember watching a Netflix show. I remember being in a sports game with my dad, right, or my mom or whoever it is, right? It's just something that's fundamental, I think, to society. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, I grew up with my dad and my great joy now is taking my kids. And, yeah. you know, we're all three going to games over Christmas and, and that's part of being a family and, and part of, you know, why sport works so well. It builds itself into your life. You know, it makes people come together. You know, the the, the classic Nick Hornby book and, and turned into the baseball film as well as the soccer film of Fever Pitch was all about the fact he couldn't talk to his dad as a teenager, um, but he could sit next to him at a football match and feel he was with them. And, and that's why sport is so special, is that idea that you are with other people and it doesn't need to be spoken necessarily. It's just that sense that you're part of a wider community, that you're caring about something that other people are caring about, the peaks and lows of emotions shared with family members, with other friends. You know, that's what makes it so special. And regardless of the media vehicle that that's going to be there, it's it's a positive thing that it's going to be there for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously you talked about positive and then also the fact that Facebook has been in the news quite a bit for a lot of th different things. For you guys on the sports side, what is what is, what are those concerns have been that you've heard from partners, and how have you been able to, to address them, or at least kind of be like, hey, look, like yes, we know this is going on, but we need to make sure that you know X Y Z is good. I look, the fundamental part for being in part of this industry is that you're part of a growth story, and. You know, I've been through sort of all these different companies on a very winding route to get there. Some of them have definitely not been growth stories. And yeah. You've had to lay people off and you've had to sort of worry about your immediate P&L. And Facebook's not like that. It's clearly a growth business. It's one which is looking to the future, investing in technology, you know, things like Portal and Oculus. It's tremendous to be around the sort of engineers who are building that. And therefore, to be part of that energy, to be part of that sense of we're, we're a future-looking company, I think is, is really important and, and really sort of um, enlightening. And you talked about growth. Where's the biggest growth opportunities for Facebook outside of sport or in sports? I mean, outside of, you know, AR and VR, where are you kind of looking at as like someone who's built and helped sell companies and different things like that? Growth opportunities for you guys specifically on the sports side? I think you look at the technology and the doors the technology is opening up. So you look at things like Messenger, at WhatsApp, at Oculus. You look at where that can take the sports industry and find that connection between what Facebook is building and what the sports industry needs. And if we can help find the middle ground that works for both organizations, then that's a good place to be. You've talked about WhatsApp and Messenger a little bit. What are what are some teams doing there? Because I don't think that's something, you know, people don't really realize we're on the surface, right? Facebook is Facebook and Instagram, but then you have WhatsApp and Messenger and, and the influence that those have. What are some of the teams doing there or some of the areas that you found from a case study, I guess, perspective that has been pretty successful? Sure. I mean, there's been various things done, but I think things like having a, effectively a one-on-one -on -one relationship, talking to the bot at the other end, but feeling like it's conversational conversation that's really interesting. So going through your ticket buying process that way, getting information about your match day. You know, we do this um, bot with the French football um, organization where you go to a game there and it's a, a remarkable experience because they're messaging you all the way through saying the traffic problems are here and here on your way to the game. The turnstiles you want to go to are this one and this one because there's less queues. The food queues are better here. The team news has just come in and you get this constant stream of personalized information for you. And that's a great way of engaging with your fan and giving them a better experience and also feeling that you as a sports organization are working directly for them. And I think that's the sort of opportunity that I really like opening up. And also challenges too. I think that's an interesting point is like, what are some of these teams leagues coming to you from a challenge standpoint saying, 
hey, Peter and team, like, how can we solve X? What is what is that X that they're trying to solve beyond probably just like, how do we get new audiences? Uh, honestly, the first thing is really audience yeah. development, you know, and um, we often go with like really long presentations of all the sort of, you know, book of things that we can open. And the number one factor is how do we find our next audience? And, and that's the right thing for a sports organization because you've permanently got to be looking at how you engage with younger demographics, with worldwide demographics, how you spread your fan base and therefore prepare better for the future. So we do offer up lots of different business solutions, whether it be branded content or commerce and conversion, but fundamentally audience development is the number one thing that I think we can help with. And I think it's important that that audience development is front and center in a sports organization's mind. It's really easy to think about the now and winning today's game and getting through the, the P&L for this season. But thinking about the future, how do you build a really strong base for your organization? I think that's that's got to be central to what you do. And speaking about the future, obviously we've talked about it a little bit, but the future of you, right? What, what from your standpoint, you've you've been pretty much anywhere in this industry, right? And done a little bit of everything. Kind of what do you see like your role shaking out? And what what is it that you want to do over the next five, ten years that you know you think outside of even potentially here that is the next thing for you in terms of just growth overall as a career? I think the good thing about Facebook is that I don't feel like I'm in like a set role that is yeah. stuck and that's what I'm going to do. Whereas, so what happens when you're a mile apart from your coworkers? Yeah, that, that also helps. <laughs> but, um, but it's more the sense that the product, the company is so so um, uh, transitory, you know, and it's permanently changing, permanently developing. And that keeps me interested. You know, I know I have a short attention span. Right? And, and if you look so it's at, not just millennials. It, it's, it's, yeah, if you look at my job career, there's no way I can defend myself for not having a short <laughs> attention span. But the good thing about Facebook is the job is permanently evolving. You know, the tools they're putting at your disposal is permanently evolving. And hopefully we can match those with what the sports industry needs and, and build something useful. Finishing up here, You've said you've been to 81 countries, seen the seen the airports and the in the pitch. What's your favorite airport pitch combination? That's a really good question. That um, I did some bizarre ones sort of over the years. Um, so going to places like Lesotho in uh, in darkest Africa or Zaire or Cameroon, you know, those were amazing trips because you really felt like. And the, according to your LinkedIn, you were illegally detained there or something like that. I got arrested a few times, but, <laughs> but that's just being a good journalist, right? Yeah, of you course. Know, you ask difficult questions in difficult places, you're going to get arrested a few times. Um, and, and normally I got out again quite quickly. Um, so, you know, gr great to go and taste all those different places, you know, and, and see different things. Um, you know, being in... India and watching the biggest cricket games with 120,000 people going crazy is, is pretty remarkable. Um, but for me, it's still going back to like my local football team, watching them. I'll be back there over Christmas. You know, that's my best playing and, and club experience. Awesome. I love it. And you talked about the journalism side. And we didn't really get too much into it. But how do you feel like the journalism side and being someone who is a journalist prepared you for someone and the role that you're in now where you can kind of have both sides of, of the experience and both sides of the media kind of spectrum? I think it's really useful, you know, and um, it's something that I'm, I'm very grateful that I went through. You know, I was really lucky in that I started in radio at 16, um, commentating and reporting on games, and it sort of forced you to grow up, you know, and it, and it gave you a lot more confidence in dealing with people, and it taught you about building relationships and, and sort of being a bit more grounded, I guess, than, than some people you meet in the industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to have to go on the team bus to... Um, away games because I'm like 16 I can't drive you know we're not as lucky in the UK as we are in the, in the yeah. US about driving yeah. so you'd literally have to sit on the bus next to players that you just criticized on the radio for two hours um, and, <laughs> and, and they'd be like a foot taller than you and a lot wider than you and, and going through that experience is a good experience yeah. you know it teaches you a lot and um, you know really glad I did it I mean the the journalism part of it took me to some remarkable places and, and you know, I think again, um, I, I think I've been really lucky to be in places where big stories happened. You know, I was in South Africa when Mandela got elected. I was in Moscow when Gorbachev and Yeltsin were fighting at the White House. Um, I would I filmed in PLO camps um, in Palestine sort of and, and interviewed guys there that, you know, basically couldn't get out of that camp but were great soccer players. Um, filmed behind the Berlin Wall just before and just after it fell. Um, so, you know, got to touch um, things that were remarkable experiences. But the best part of it all was that, you know, as long as you're a sports fan, 
you could get by in all those places because genuinely, normally as a soccer fan, that there was a conversation you could have. You know, as a cricket fan in India, you can talk to anybody all over the country, even if they speak some regional dialect. You mention the name of like key players and, and faces light up and you've bonded with people. And so, you get out of jail too, right? The, you know, <laughs> it helps get you out of trouble sometimes.